Hello and welcome to the sixth video of the Perun Santis video series. Today I will read the complete fifth Santi, verses 65 to 80, and I will talk about the fall of Atlantis, the Grace, and Bulgakov's death of the great wanderer. And I shall raise my Japanese companion, whom I've grown very fond of, and have a toast to Peru. Verse 65 And Ognislav of the Svitarus kin and sage of the great temple of Inglia asked Perun Thunderer, Tell us, Perun father, what does the future for the descendants of all kins of the great race and the heavenly family hold? What destiny awaits them? after our departure for the heavenly law Pravi and our sacred wise ancestors. The all-wise God answered, Listen to me, great keeper of the prime evil fire, and you, ministers of gods of the sacred race and the heavenly family. Like the celestial Iria that divides the heavenly Svarga into two parts, the stream of time river will bring great changes in its flow. The sacred land of the great race will change its face. The Darian wind will bring a great fall of temperature to this land, and Marena will cover it with her white cloak for a third of the year. There will be no food for humans and animals during this time, and the great migration of the descendants of the heavenly kin to the Ripian mountains, protector of the western borders of the sacred race, will begin. The Darian wind is the north wind. Marena, as I've said before, is the goddess of winter and stillness of mortal nature. And that white cloak is snow. And the Ripian Mountains are the Ural Mountains. So the Ice Age is forcing them to leave Siberia, the Irian Asgard, and they are now moving towards west. And they will reach the great waters of the Western Ocean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean. And the heavenly force will carry them to the land of the beardless humans, with skin and the color of the flame of the sacred fire. The great leader will build in that land the temple of the trident of the god of seas, and Ni, God of the seas will send them his innumerable gifts and protect them from evil elements. The heavenly force is the white man or white mana or vita mana. <clears throat> and there's also a white mar. And a white mar can hold 144 white mans. And this heavenly force that is carrying them across the Atlantic Ocean. What is that? Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? That could be some kind of spaceship, maybe. And the land of the beardless humans, that would be Antland, also known as Atlantis. And according to uh, this text, um, Atlantis was located uh, west-south of the coast of Morocco in northern Africa, in the Atlantic Ocean. And Ni, the god of the seas, is also known as Poseidon or um, Neptune or Njord in the northern stories.
Okay, so verse 69. <clears throat> but great prosperity will cloud the minds of leaders and sages. Great laziness and desire for another's will seize their mind. And they will start lying to gods and humans. And they will start living by their own laws, violating the covenants of their wise progenitors and the laws of the united God creator. And they will use the force of the elements of Midgard earth to achieve their goals. And by their deeds they will enrage Ni, great god of the seas. Yeah, so the fall of the gods has begun because they're creating their own laws now and they're lying. And Ni and the elements of earth will destroy that land and it will hide in the depths of the great waters. Just like sacred Daria in ancient times, hiding in the depths of the northern waters. Yeah, so we all know the story about Atlantis. So this is what's happening now. Antland is going down under. <laughs> and um, sacred Daria in ancient times, um, when the Aryans first came to Earth, they came from the Karuna galaxy. Karuna is the spirit of the Aryans. So that was their old home and they had to flee and they found refuge on Earth. And the first uh, place they settled was the North Pole. Daria, the land of the Aryans, is the North Pole. Yeah, and when that went down under, they moved uh, southeast and this is when they ended up in Siberia. So everybody is talking about Antarctica, and I'm sure there's lots of fascinating things to be discovered, but I'm more interested actually in the North Pole. <clears throat> the gods of the race will save the righteous ones, and the heavenly force will carry them to the east, to the land of humans with skin and the color of darkness. So, so they're going from Atlantis east, so they're going to the mainland North Africa, Egypt. Yeah, so um, yeah, so the descendants of the great race are now being brought to Egypt. And the beardless humans with skin in the color of the flame of the sacred fire will be carried by the heavenly force to the boundless lands that lie at the setting of the Yarila sun. The sun sets in the west so we're talking about America. Yeah, Yarila Sun, Yarila is the old name of our sun. Yeah, so the Antlanders from Atlantis. So those are the, the ones that we know as the Native Americans. So these are actually the ones that originate in Atlantis. Okay, so Humans with skin in the color of darkness, so we're back in Egypt now, will honor the descendants of the heavenly kin as gods, and they will learn many sciences from them. People from the great race will build new cities and temples, and they will teach humans with skin in the color of darkness how to grow cereals and vegetables. Four kins of the great race will in turns teach new sages ancient wisdom and they will build Triranian tombs, artificial mountains in form of the tetrahedral. <laughs> so, so obviously they like building. Everywhere they go they build great things. And it is today actually um, not a conspiracy theory anymore. It has been scientifically proven by newest DNA analysis methods that Tut Ench Amun, for example, was a Celt. Yeah? And according to these scriptures, the first four dynasties of the pharaohs were Aryans. And the artificial mountain in form of the tetrahedra is a pyramid. 
while other kins of the great race will settle over the whole face of Midgard Earth and they will cross the Himavat Mountains. Yeah, so now we have seen how they, how some of them went west over the Ural Mountains and others went from Siberia south over the Himavat Mountains, which is the Himalaya. And they will teach humans with skin in the color of darkness. This is now in India. Wisdom of the world of radiances. The world, the wisdom of the world of radiances is one of the three Vedic um, books that are out there. In order that they would stop their terrible blood sacrifices to their goddess, Black Mother, and snake dragons from the world of Navi, and that they would acquire new divine wisdom and faith. The Black Mother is Kali. Many kins of the great race will spread over all parts of Midgard Earth, beyond the Ripian Mountains, and they will build new cities and temples and save the faith of the ancestors and secret Vedas, given by Tyr Dashbok and other light gods. Many kins of the great race and the heavenly family will shepherd countless flocks of animals and move from land to land and they will become related with other kins of the heavenly family. But alien enemies will come out of the world of darkness and they will start to, to say flattering words to the human children, covered with lies. And they will start to seduce the old and the young and take human daughters as wives. They will intermix amongst themselves and with humans and with animals. And they will begin to teach this to all nations of Midgard Earth. And those who refuse to listen to their words and refuse to follow the vile deeds of the aliens will commit to torments and sufferings. Um, the, um, the Russian word for this intermixing that has been used in the original translation from the runic text Okay, so I apologize for all Russian speakers because I'm really bad at pronouncing these, some of these words. I will try. It's Irinirovac. Irinirovac. Yeah. So anyway, so this word um, means to connect, to melt, to mix, but not only on a biological or genetic level level, but also on a non-material level, for example, psychologically and mentally. Yeah? This is how they're intermixing with the humans. And this taking of human daughters, this is also being described in the book of Enoch in the first chapter, The Watchers, when they're talking about the messengers coming down and taking um, human daughters as wives and then they're creating these giants that will eventually um, devour all humans. <clears throat> so now the question is who are these alien enemies that are coming from the world of darkness? Are these alien enemies beings from another planet that come here? Or are these alien enemies maybe children of our own clouded minds? Are these alien enemies maybe thoughts, uh, our own dark thoughts from the depth of our own subconscious? So that's the question. And it says, as inside, so outside. So maybe it's both. So maybe it's our own dark thoughts and our own subconscious, which is darkness, because we are not conscious of our subconscious, it's in the dark. We are not aware of these thoughts, these ideas. And so maybe they are manifesting outside of us. Yeah, possible. Okay, so some of them 
So, still talking about the alien enemies. Some of them are trying to enter Midgard Earth even right now. In order to do their dark deeds and to seduce sons and daughters of the great race away from the path of the light forces. Their objective is to spoil the souls of human children that they would never reach the light world of Pravi and heavenly Asgard, home of the god patrons of the heavenly kin and the great race, or the celestial earths and settlements where your light wise ancestors rest. Yeah, so they want humans to stay forever a prisoner in this loop. That's what they want. Yeah? And they're doing this by hijacking our nature like a parasite. A parasite cannot survive on its own. It has um, it, it needs a host to survive. Yeah, so these parasites are feeding off our energy. They're hijacking us. Yeah. To keep us down. And to keep us away from truth. An interesting thing I like to mention um, in Sanskrit. So Russian is a very ancient language and Russian and Sanskrit they are very similar. If you have a person speaking Russian and a person speaking Sanskrit and they get together they can understand each other perfectly. Yeah? And um, in Sanskrit the word Sat, S-A-T, is truth. And the prefix or the affix a or an is the negation. So sat an is the truth negator. You will recognize the alien enemies by their gray skin. Their eyes have the color of darkness and they are hermaphrodites. They can be either male or female. Every one of them can be either father or mother. They paint their faces in order to resemble human children and they never take off their clothes so that their animal nudity would not be exposed. Animal nudity, we remember, um, when Odin's brothers took the third cup of the drink, they turned into animals, meaning they lost their mind. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they are animals. So, you know, it can mean you lose your mind, so you become like an animal. But, you know, there's always um, many... Um, many meanings, as I said before. So it can be both. Because we know stories in the Bible also of women um, interbreeding with animals, for example. Or Alexander the Great, yeah, his own mother told him that the god Zeus came down in form of a snake into her and this is how Alexander the Great was created. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah. Never know. And um, so you can recognize them by their gray skin, the grays, gray. Yeah, the German word for gray is grau. And grausam means cruel or horrible or frightening. And hermaphrodites, so a hermaphrodite is someone who is born with both genders. Yeah, they have both genders. And back in the days in the, in the northern world, uh, these people, I mean, of course, they were very rare, but it's a fact that they, it does happen. And they were considered to be really, really special. And they would... Um, they would grow up to become great healers or, sh or shamans, yeah, something like that. Because they were considered to have special gifts because they would um, physically embody this holy union of the male and the female energies. 
that's necessary to reach the Ha. Ra im Ha. Yeah, I've talked about this. Okay. So, verse 77. With lies and unrighteous flattery, they will conquer many lands of Midgard earth as they had already done on other earths in many worlds and times of the last great Asa. But they will be defeated and sent to the land of artificial mountains, Egypt, where humans with skin in the color of darkness and descendants of the heavenly kin who came from the land of the god Ni live together. And human children will start to teach them how to work so that they would be able to grow cereals and vegetables themselves to feed their own children. So in times of the last great Asa, this Asa is the space war between the light and the dark forces. And the word Asa, you have As, Azir, like Asgard, um, the garden of the Azir. As, Sa, so you have this mirrored, you have the Azir mirrored. So who are they fighting against? Are they fighting against outside beings or are they fighting against themselves? Yeah, that's the question. They're fighting against their own darkness inside me. Yeah? And as I said, as inside, so outside. So the outside world is basically a mirror of your inside. But the absence of desire to work unites the aliens. <laughs> See, they don't want to do the work. They don't want to do the work. That's where they're not getting anywhere. And they will leave the land of artificial mountains and settle all over Midgard Earth. So great, right? So now they're everywhere. <laughs> and they will create their own religion and proclaim themselves as sons of the united God. And they will start sacrificing the blood of their own and of their children to their God. To create a blood union between them and their God. Yeah. Those are the Satanists from today. So even though this text is 40,000 years old, some things never change. And these people, this is our so-called elite yeah, today. And the light gods will start to send them wanderers most wise, for they have neither spirit nor conscience. These wanderers most wise are basically preachers, because they have neither spirit nor conscience. As I said, they are parasites. They have no soul. Yeah, That's where they have to hijack our nature. They need us. We think we need them, but it's the other way around. They need us. Okay? And the aliens will listen to their wise words. And after having listened to them, they will sacrifice the lives of the wanderers to their god. And they will create the golden Taurus as a symbol of their power. And they will worship it the same way as their god. So now they're building this golden Taurus. What's a Taurus? A Taurus can be a tower and a Taurus can be a bull. We have the Tower of Babylon and then we have the building of the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. Just look at a picture of this building and look at a picture of the Tower of Babylon and you will see a great resemblance when you compare these two buildings. Yeah. And then we have the golden bull in front of Wall Street. Okay. So the cycle of the false law has begun.
and the light gods will send to them great wanderer carrying love. But the priests of the golden Taurus will make a martyr out of him. And through his death they will declare him God. And they will create a new religion built on lies, blood and oppression. And they will declare all nations to be inferior and sinful and call them to repent before the face of the God they have created and to ask forgiveness for deeds done and undone. So, now we will hear about the Great Wanderer. I shall raise my glass to all those barbaric pagans and to the Great Wanderer who was sent to save the lost children of Israel. And as we know, he did not succeed. <clears throat> so now I'm reading the most part of the second chapter of my all-time ever favorite book of all times and of all worlds by Mikhail Bulgakov, The Master and Margarita. I have this book in English and German. And Mikhail Bulgakov was born um, 1891 in um, Kiev, and he died 1940 in Moscow. And this book is this is his um, life's work. Like his whole life is in this book, and he was also a great, great fan of Goethe's Faust. And those who know the Faust will also see this in this book quite clearly. <laughs> And um, and this book was of course censored because um, the aim of uh, communism and, and during that time there was uh, this communism under Stalin and, and Russia no, Soviet Soviet Union um, and and the aim of communism is to what do you say to exchange. Uh, to replace, to replace God with the state. So that's the reason why this book was censored. And, but, uh, yeah, and then he died in 1940, but his widow did not give up. And in 1960, finally, finally, this book was published and it became um, a great classic, like, immediately and now this book is um, part of Russian education today. So and here we go. Have I raised my glass to Mikhail Bulgakov yet? No I haven't. To Mikhail Bulgakov and the Master and Margarita the greatest book of all times and all worlds. I highly recommend. Oh, and there's this mini series. Usually, you're all uh, I. I'm usually always disappointed when you read the book, and then you see a film and you think, oh, it's you know, bad. But not in this case. This mini series is fantastic, and I will leave a link to a YouTube channel in the description um, that hosts all the episodes. It's in Russian with English subtitles. Okay, and here we go. The second chapter is called Pontius Pilat. And here we go. <clears throat> In a white cloak with blood red lining, with the shuffling gait of a cavalry man, early in the morning of the 14th day of the spring month of Nisan, there came out to the covered colonnade between the two wings of the palace of Herod the Great, the procurator of Judea, Pontius Pilate. 
More than anything in the world, the procurator hated the smell of rose oil. And now everything foreboded a bad day, because this smell had been pursuing the procurator since dawn. It seemed to the procurator that a rosy smell exuded from the cypresses and palms in the garden, that the smell of leather trappings and sweat from the convoy was mingled with the cursed rosy flux. From the outbuildings at the back of the palace, where the first cohort of the Twelfth Lightning Legion, which had come to Yerushalayim with the procurator, was quartered. A whiff of smoke reached the colonnade across the upper terrace of the palace, and the slightly acrid smoke, which testified that the centuries mess that the centuries mess cooks had begun to prepare dinner was mingled with the same thick rosy scent. O oh, gods, gods, why do you punish me? Yes, no doubt, this is it. This is it again, the invincible, terrible illness. Hemicrania, when half of the head aches. There's no remedy for it, no escape. I'll try not to move my head. On the mosaic floor by the fountain a chair was already prepared, and the procurator, without looking at anyone, sat in it and reached his hand out to one side. His secretary deferentially placed a sheet of parchment in his hand. Unable to suppress a painful grimace, the procurator ran a cursory, sidelong glance over the writing returned the parchment to the secretary and said with difficulty, The accused is from Galilee? Was the case sent to the Tetrarch? Yes, procurator, replied the secretary. And what then? He refused to make a decision on the case and sent the Sanhedrin's death sentence to you for confirmation. The secretary explained. The procurator twitched his cheek and said quietly, Bring in the accused. And at once two legionaries brought a man of about 27 from the garden terrace to the balcony under the columns and stood him before the procurator's chair. Yeah, 27 is an interesting age. Many people died at 27. Coincidentally. The man was dressed in an old and torn light blue chiton. His head was covered by a white cloth with a leather band around the forehead, and his hands were bound behind his back. Under the man's left eye there was a large bruise in the corner of his mouth, a cut caked with blood. The man gazed at the procurator with anxious curiosity. The latter paused, then asked quietly in Aramaic, So it was you who incited the people to destroy the temple of Yerushalayim? The procurator sat as if made of stone while he spoke, and only his lips moved slightly as he pronounced the words. The procurator was as if made of stone because he was afraid to move his head aflame with infernal pain. The man with bound hands leaned forward somewhat and began to speak. Good man, believe me, but the procurator, motionless as before and not raising his voice in the least, straight away interrupted him. Is it me that you are calling a good man? You are mistaken. It is whispered about me in Yerushalayim that I am a fierce monster. And that is perfectly correct. Yes, so he has to keep up his image. <laughs> and he added in the same monotone, Bring the centurion rat slayer. It seemed to everyone that it became darker on the balcony when the centurion of the first century, Mark, nicknamed rat slayer, 
presented himself before the procurator. Red Slayer was a head taller than the tallest soldier of the legion, and so broad in the shoulders that he completely blocked out the still low sun. The procurator addressed the centurion in Latin. The criminal calls me good man. Take him outside for a moment. Explain to him how I ought to be spoken to, but no maiming. And everyone except the motionless procurator followed Mark Ratzlayer with their eyes as he motioned to the arrested man, indicating that he should go with him. Everyone generally followed Ratzlayer with their eyes wherever he appeared because of his height and those who were seeing him for the first time also because the centurion's face was disfigured. His nose had once been smashed by a blow from a Germanic club. Yeah. Mark's heavy boots thudded across the mosaic. The bound man noiselessly went out with him. Complete silence fell in the colonnade, and one could hear pigeons cooing in the garden terrace near the balcony, and water singing an intricate, pleasant song in the fountain. The procurator would have liked to get up, put his temple under the spout, and stay standing that way, but he knew that even that would not help. Having brought the arrested man from under the columns out to the garden, Red Slayer took a whip from the hands of, the, of a legionary who was standing at the foot of a bronze statue and, swinging easily, struck the arrested man across the shoulders. The centurion's movement was casual and light, yet the bound man instantly collapsed on the ground as if his legs had been cut from under him. He gasped for air, the color drained from his face, and his eyes went vacant. With his left hand only, Mark heaved the fallen man into the air like an empty sack, set him on his feet, and spoke nasally and poorly pronounced Aramaic. The Roman procurator is called Hegemon. Use no other words. Stand at attention. Do you understand me? or do I hit you? The arrested man swayed, but got hold of himself. His color returned. He caught his breath and answered hoarsely, I understand. Don't beat me. A moment later he was again standing before the procurator. A lustreless, sick voice sounded. Name? Mine? The arrested man hastily responded, his whole being expressing a readiness to answer sensibly, without provoking further wrath. The procurator said softly, I know my own. Don't pretend to be stupider than you are. Yours. Yeshua. The prisoner replied promptly, Any surname? Ganutsri. Where do you come from? The town of Galama replied the prisoner, indicating with his head that there, somewhere far off to his right, in the north, was the town of Galama, uh, Gamala. Who are you by blood? I don't know exactly. The arrested man replied animately, I don't remember my parents. I was told that my father was a Syrian. Syria, Assyria, it's also um, Aryan. Where is your permanent residence? I have no permanent home, the prisoner answered shyly. I travel from town to town. That can be put more briefly in a word, a vagrant. The procurator said and asked. Any family? None. I'm alone in the world. Can you read and write? Yes. Do you know any language beside Aramaic? Yes, Greek. A swollen eyelid rose, an eye clouded with suffering fixed the arrested man. The other eye remained shut. Pilat spoke in Greek. So it was you who was going to destroy the temple building and called on the people to do that? 
Here the prisoner again became animated. His eyes ceased to show fear and he spoke in Greek. Never a good... Here terror flashed in the prisoner's eye because he had nearly made a slip. Never, Hegemon. Never in my life was I going to destroy the temple building, nor did I incite anyone to this senseless act. Surprise showed on the face of the secretary, hunched over a low table and writing down the testimony. He raised his head, but immediately bent it to the parchment again. All sorts of people gather in this town for the feast. Among them there are magicians, astrologers, diviners and murderers, the procurator spoke in monotone, and occasionally also liars. You, for instance, are a liar. It is written clearly, incited to destroy the temple. People have testified to it. These good people, the prisoner spoke, and hastily adding hegemon, went on, haven't any learning and have confused everything I told them. Generally, I'm beginning to be afraid that this confusion may go on for a very long time. And all because he writes down the things I say incorrectly. Silence fell. By now both sick eyes rested heavily on the prisoner. I repeat to you, but for the last time, stop pretending that you're a madman, robber, Pilate said softly and monotonously. There's not much written in your record, but what's there is enough to hang you. No, no, Hegemon, the arrested man said, straining all over in his wish to convince. There's one with the goatskin parchment who follows me. Follows me and keeps riding all the time. But once I peeked into his parchment and was horrified. I said decidedly nothing of what's written there. I implored him, burn your parchment, I beg you. But he tore it out of my hands and ran away. Who is that? Pilate asked squeamishly and touched his temple with his hand. Matthew Levy, the prisoner explained willingly. He used to be a tax collector and I first met him on the road in Beth Farsh, where a fig grove juts out at an angle and I got to talking with him. He treated me hostily at first and even insulted me, that is, thought he insulted me by calling me a dog. Here the prisoner smiled. I personally see nothing bad about this animal that I should be offended by this word. The secretary stopped writing and stealthily cast a surprised glance, not at the arrested man, but at the procurator. However, after listening to me, he began to soften, Yeshua went on. Finally, threw the money down in the road and said he would go journeying with me. Pilate grinned with one cheek. <laughs> bearing yellow teeth and said, turning his whole body towards the secretary. So, then he turns and then he says, O oh, city of Yerushalayim, what does one not hear in it? A tax collector? Do you hear? Threw money down in the road? <laughs> not knowing how to reply to that, the secretary found it necessary to repeat Pilate's smile. He said that henceforth money had become hateful to him. Yeshua explained Matthew Levy's strange action and added, and since then he has been my companion. His teeth still bared, the procurator glanced at the arrested man, then at the sun, steadily rising over the equestrian statutes of the Hippodrome, which lay far below to the right, and suddenly, in some sickening anguish, thought that the simplest thing would be to drive the strange robber off the balcony by uttering just two words, hang him. 
to drive the convoy away as well, to leave the colonnade, go into the palace, order the room darkened, collapse, uh, collapse on the bed, send for cold water, call in a plaintive voice for his dog Banga, and complain to him about the hemicrania. And the thought of poison suddenly flashed, temptingly in the procurator's sick head. He gazed with dull eyes at the arrested man, and was silent for a time, painfully trying to remember why there stood before him in the pitiless morning sunlight of Jerusalem this prisoner with his face disfigured by beating, and what other utterly unnecessary questions he had to ask him. Matthew Levy, the sick man asked in a hoarse voice and closed his eyes. Yes, Matthew Levy. The high, tormenting voice came to him. And what was it, in any case, that you said about the temple to the crowd in the bazaar? The responding voice seemed to stab at Pilate's temple, was inexpressibly painful, and this voice was saying, I said, Hegemon, that the temple of the old faith would fall, and a new temple of truth would be built. I said it that way so as to make it more understandable. So a temple does not have to be a building. But this is how people understand. And why did you stir up the people in the bazaar, you vagrant, talking about the truth of which you have no notion? What is truth? And here the procurator thought, oh my gods, I'm asking him about something unnecessary at a trial. My reason no longer serves me. And again he pictured a cup of dark liquid. Poison, bring me poison. And again he heard the voice. The truth is, first of all, that your head aches. And aches so badly that you're having faint-hearted thoughts of death. You're not only unable to speak to me, but it is even hard for you to look at me, and I am now your unwilling torturer which upsets me. You can't even think about anything and only dream that your dog should come, apparently the one being you are attached to. But your suffering will soon be over, your headache will go away. The secretary goggled his eyes at the prisoner and stopped riding in mid-word. Pilate raised his tormented eyes to the prisoner and saw that the sun already stood quite high over the hippodrome, that a ray had penetrated the colonnade and was stealing towards Yeshua's worn sandals, and that the man was trying to step out of the sun's way. Here the procurator rose from his chair, clutched his head with his hands, and his yellowish, shaven face expressed dread but he instantly suppressed it with his will and lowered himself into his chair again. The prisoner meanwhile continued his speech, but the secretary was no longer writing it down, and only stretched his neck like a goose, trying not to let drop a single word. Well, there, it's all over, the arrested man said, glancing bene benevolently at Pilate, and I'm extremely glad of it. I'd advise you, Hegemon, to leave the palace for a while, and go for a stroll somewhere in the vicinity, say, in the gardens on the Mount of Olives. A storm will come. Later on, towards evening, a stroll would do you much good, and I would be glad to accompany you. Certain new thoughts have occurred to me, which I think you might find interesting. 
and I'd willingly share them with you, the more so as you give the impression of being a very intelligent man. The secretary turned deathly pale and dropped the scroll on the floor. <laughs> the trouble is, the bound man went on, not stopped by anyone, that you are too closed off and have definitely, definitely lost faith in people. You must agree, one can't place all one's affection in a dog. Your life is impoverished, Hegemon. And here the speaker allowed himself to smile. The secretary now thought of only one thing, whether to believe his ears or not. <laughs> he had to believe. <laughs> then he tried to imagine precisely what whimsical form the wrath of the hot-tempered procurator would take at this unheard of impudence from the prisoner. <laughs> And this the secretary was unable to imagine, though he knew the procurator well. Then came the cracked hoarse voice of the procurator who said in Latin, Unbind his hands. One of the convoy legionaries wrapped with his spear, a spear, handed it to another, went over and took the ropes of the prisoner. The secretary picked up his scroll, having decided to record nothing for now, and to be surprised at nothing. <laughs> Admit, Pilate asked softly in Greek, that you are a great physician? No, Procurator, I am not a physician, the prisoner replied, delightedly rubbing a crimped and swollen purple wrist. Scowling deeply, Pilate bored the prisoner with his eyes, and these eyes were no longer dull, but flashed with sparks familiar to all. I didn't ask you, Pilate said. Maybe you also know Latin? Yes, I do, the prisoner replied. Color came to Pilate's yellowish, yellowish cheeks, and he asked in Latin. How did you know I wanted to call my dog? It's very simple, the prisoner replied in Latin. You were moving your hand in the air, and the prisoner repeated Pilate's gesture, as if you wanted to stroke something, and your lips, yes, said Pilate. There was silence. Then Pilate asked a question in Greek. And so, you are a physician? No, no, the prisoner replied animatedly. Believe me, I am not a physician. Very well, then. If you want to keep it a secret, do so. It has no direct bearing on the case. So you, man so you maintain that you did not incite anyone to destroy or set fire to or in any other way demolish the temple? I repeat, I did not incite anyone to such acts, Hegemon. Do I look like a half-wit? <laughs> oh, no, you don't look like a half-wit, the procurator replied quietly and smiled some strange smile. Swear, then, that it wasn't so. By what do you want me to swear, the unbound man asked, very animated. Well, let's say, by your life. The procurator replied, It's high time you swore by it, since it's hanging by a hair, I can tell you. You don't think it was you who hung it, Hegemon? The prisoner asked. If so, you are very mistaken. Pilate gave a start and replied through his teeth, I can cut that hair. In that, too, you are mistaken, the prisoner retorted, smiling brightly and shielding himself from the sun with his hand. You must agree that surely only he who hung it can cut the hair. So, so, Pilate said, smiling. Now I have no doubts that the idle loafers of Yerushalayim followed at your heels. 
I don't know who hung such a tongue on you, but he hung it well. Incidentally, tell me, is it true that you entered Yerushalayim by the Susa gate riding on an ass? Donkey. Accompanied by a crowd of riffraff who shouted greetings to you as some kind of prophet? Here the procurator pointed to the parchment scroll. Apparently it's written down, right? So it must be true. The prisoner glanced at the procurator in perplexity. I don't even have an ass, Hegemon, <laughs> he said. <laughs> I did enter Yerushalayim by the Susa gate, but on foot, accompanied only by Matthew Levy, and no one shouted anything to me because no one in Yerushalayim knew me then. Do you happen to know, Pilate continued without taking his eyes off the prisoner, such men as a certain Dismas, another named Gestas, and a third named Baraban? I do not know these good people, the prisoner replied. Truly? Truly. And now tell me, why is it that you use the words good people all the time? Do you call everyone that or what? Everyone, the prisoner replied. There are no evil people in the world. The first I hear of it, Pilate said, grinning. But perhaps I know too little of life. You needn't record any more, he addressed the secretary, who had not recorded anything anyway, and went on talking with the prisoner. You read, uh, you read that in some Greek book? No, I figured it out for myself. And you preach it? Yes. But take, for instance, the centurion Mark, the one known as Ratslayer. Is he good? Yes, replied the prisoner. True, he's an unhappy man. Since the good people disfigured him, he has become cruel and hard. I'd be curious to know who maimed him. I can willingly tell you that, Pilate responded, for I was a witness to it. The good people fell on him like dogs on a bear. There were Germani fastened on his neck, his arms, his legs. The infantry maniple was encircled, and if one flank hadn't been cut by a cavalry term of which I was the commander, you, philosopher, would not have had the chance to speak with the rat slayer. That was at the battle of Edistavisu in the Valley of the Virgins. If I could speak with him, the prisoner suddenly said musingly, I'm sure he changed sharply. I don't suppose, Pilate responded, that you'd bring much joy to the legate of the legion if you decided to talk with any of his officers or soldiers. Anyhow, it's also not going to happen, fortunately for everyone, and I will be the first to see to it. <laughs> At that moment, a swallow swiftly flitted into the colonnade, described a circle under a golden ceiling, swooped down, almost brushed the face of a bronze statue in a niche with its pointed wing, and disappeared behind the capital of a column. It may be that it thought of nesting there. During its flight, a formula took shape in the now light and lucid heat of the procurator. It went like this. The hegemon has looked into the case of the vagrant philosopher Yeshua, alias Granotsri, and found in it no grounds for indictment. In particular, he has found not the slightest connection between the acts of Yeshua and the disorders that have lately taken place in Yerushalayim. The vagrant philosopher has proved to be mentally ill. Consequently, the procurator has not confirmed the death sentence on Hanosri passed by the lesser Sanhedrin. 
but seeing that Hanotri's mad utopian talk might cause disturbances in Yerushalayim, the procurator is removing Yeshua from Yerushalayim and putting him under confinement in Stratonian Caesarea on the Mediterranean that is precisely where the procurator's residence was. So, so he he likes the idea of going for a stroll with Yeshua and yeah, talking to him. It remained to dictate it to the secretary. The swallow's wings whiffled right over the Higimon's head. The bird darted to the fountain basin and then flew in and flew out into freedom. The procurator raised his eyes to the prisoner and saw the dust blaze up in a pillar around him. Is that all about him? Pilat asked the secretary. Unfortunately, not. The secretary replied unexpectedly and handed Pilat another piece of parchment. What's this now? Pilat asked and frowned. Having read what had been handed to him, he changed countenance even more. Either the dark blood rose to his neck and face, or something else happened. Only his skin lost its yellow tinge, turned brown, and his eyes seemed to sink. Again, it was probably owing to the blood rising to his temples and throbbing in them, only something happened to the procurator's vision. Thus he imagined that the prisoner's head floated off somewhere, and another appeared in its place. On this bald head sat a scant-pointed golden diadem. On the forehead was a round canker, eating into the skin and smeared with ointment. A sunken, toothless mouth with a pendulous, capricious lower lip. It seemed to Pilat that the pink columns of the balcony and the rooftops of Yerushalayim far below beyond the garden vanished, and everything was drowned in the, thick, in the thickest green of Caprian gardens. And something strange also happened to his hearing. It was as if trumpets sounded far away, muted and menacing and a nasal voice was very clearly heard, arrogantly drawling, The Law of Lee's Majesty. Thoughts raced, short, incoherent, and extraordinary. I'm lost, then we are lost. And among them a totally absurd one, about some immortality, which immortality for some reason provoked unendurable anguish? Pilat strained, drove the apparition away, his gaze returned to the balcony, and again the prisoner's eyes were before him. Listen, Hanotsri, the procurator spoke, looking at Yeshua somehow strangely. The procurator's face was menacing, but his eyes were alarmed. Did you ever say anything about the great Caesar? Answer, did you? Yes or no? Pilate drew the word no out somewhat longer than is done in court. And his glance sent Yeshua some thought that he wished as if to install in the prisoner. Yeah, he just wants him to say no. To speak the truth is easy and pleasant, the prisoner observed. <laughs> I have no need to know, Pilate responded in a stifled, angry voice, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant for you to speak the truth. You will have to speak it anyway, but as you speak, weigh every word unless you want a not only inevitable, but also painful death. 
No one knew what had happened with the Procurator of Judea, but he allowed himself to raise his hand as if to protect himself from a ray of sunlight, and from behind his hand, as from behind a shield, to send the prisoners some sort of prompting look. Uh, of prompting look. Answer then, he went on speaking. Do you know a certain Judas from Kiriath? And what precisely did you say to him about Caesar, if you said anything? Yes, we're still hoping <laughs> that Yeshua will answer the way that he wants him to answer. It was like this. The prisoner began talking eagerly. The evening before last, near the temple, I made the acquaintance of a young man who called himself Judas, from the town of Kiriath. He invited me to his place in the lower city and treated me to a good man, Pilate asked, and a devilish fire flashed in his eyes. A very good man and an inquisi inquisitive one. The prisoner confirmed. He showed the greatest interest in my thoughts and received me very cordially. Lit the lambs, Pilate spoke through his teeth in the same tone as the prisoner and his eyes glinted. Yes, Yeshua went on, slightly surprised that the procurator was so well informed and asked me to give my view of state authority. He was extremely interested in this question. And what did you say? asked Pilate. Or are you going to reply that you have forgotten what you said? <laughs> but there was already hopelessness in Pilate's tone. Among other things, the prisoner recounted, I said, that all authority is violence over people and that a time will come when there will be no authority of the Caesars nor any other authority. Man will pass into the kingdom of truth and justice where generally there will be no need for any authority. The kingdom of truth, pravi. And justice, the law. <clears throat> go on. I didn't go on, said the prisoner. Here man ran in, bound me, and took me away to prison. The secretary, trying not to let drop a single word, rapidly traced the words on his parchment. There never has been, is not, and never will be any authority in this world greater or better for people than the authority of the Emperor Tiberius. Pilates cracked and sick voice swelled. For some reason, the procurator looked at the secretary and the convoy with hatred. And it is not for you, insane criminal, to reason about it. Here Pilate shouted, Convoy, off the balcony! And turning to the secretary, he added, Leave me alone with the criminal. This is a state matter. The convoy raised their spears and with a measured tramp of hobnailed Kalik walked off the balcony into the garden and the secretary followed the convoy. For some time the silence on the balcony was broken only by the water singing in the fountain. Pilate saw how the watery dish blew up over the spout, how its edges broke off, how it fell down in streams. The prisoner was the first to speak. I see that some misfortune has come about 
because I talked with that young man from Kiriath. I have a foreboding, Hegemon, that he will come to grief, and I am very sorry for him. I think, the procurator replied, grinning strangely, that there is now someone else in the world for whom you ought to feel sorrier than for Judas of Kiriath, and who is going to have it much worse than Judas. So then, Mark Ratslayer, a cold and convinced torturer, the people who, as I see, the procurator pointed to Yeshua's disfigured face, beat you for your preaching, the robbers Dismas and Gestas, who with their conference killed four soldiers, and finally the dirty traitor Judas, are all good people? Yes, said the prisoner. And the kingdom of truth will come? It will, Hegemon. Yeshua answered with conviction. It will never come. Pilate suddenly cried out in such a terrible voice that Yeshua drew back. Thus many years before, in the Valley of the Virgins, Pilate had cried to his horsemen the words, Cut them down! Cut them down! The giant rat slayer is trapped! He raised his voice, cracked with commanding, still more, and called out so that his words could be heard in the garden. Criminal! 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 And then, lowering his voice, he asked, Yeshua Hanotsri, do you believe in any gods? God is one, replied Yeshua. I believe in him. Then pray to him. Pray hard. However, here Pilate's voice gave out. That won't help. No wife? Pilate asked with anguish for some reason, not understanding what was happening to him. No, I'm alone. Hateful city. The procurator suddenly muttered for some reason, shaking his shoulders as if he were cold, and rubbing his hands as though washing them. If they'd put a knife in you before your meeting with Judas of Kiriath, it really would have been better. Why don't you let me go, Hegemon? The prisoner asked unexpectedly, and his voice became anxious. I see they want to kill me. A spasm contorted Pilate's face. He turned to Yeshua the inflamed, red-veined whites of his eyes and said, Do you suppose, wretch, that the Roman procurator will let a man go who has said what you have said? Oh, gods, gods, or do you think I am ready to take your place? I don't share your thoughts. And listen to me. If from this moment on you say even one word, if you speak to anyone at all, beware of me, I repeat to you, beware. Hegemon, silence! cried Pilate, and his furious gaze followed the swallow that had again fluttered onto the balcony. To me, Pilate shouted. And when the secretary and the convoy returned to their places, Pilate announced that he confirmed the death sentence passed at the meeting of the lesser Sanhedrin on the criminal Yeshua Hanotsri, and the secretary wrote down what Pilate said. A moment later, Mark Ratslayer stood before the procurator. The procurator ordered him to hand the criminal over to the head of the secret service, along with the procurator's directive that Yeshua Hanotsri was to be separated from the other condemned men, and also that the soldiers of the secret service were to be forbidden on pain of severe punishment to talk with Yeshua about anything at all or to answer any of his questions. 
And that was the death sentence and the end of the great wanderer. And I raise my glass to the great wanderer and the poor tormented procurator of Judea you would ha who would have so much liked to go on a stroll with Yeshua and listen to his ideas. But um, by his role he could not do that. Or he would have been the one they would have hanged. And as Mikhail Bulgakov says, one of the greatest human vices is cowardice. Cheers. Thank you for listening. See you next time.